Good evening, everybody. Um, we'd like to call this meeting to order, and would you please all rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Can I have the roll call, please? Mrs. Applebaum? Here. Mr. Applebaum? Here. Mr. Jacob? Here. Mr. Major? Present. Mrs. Milgerman? Dr. Ciartino? Here. Mrs. Feldman? Here. Thank you. Uh, tonight, the Board of Education is pleased to recognize Parkway's latest National Board Certified Teachers. I'd like to ask Assistant Superintendent for TLA, Teaching, Learning, and Accountability, Dr. Lisa Meredith, to please come forward. Good evening, President Feldman, um, members of the board, Dr. Marty, Ms. Stowe. I am um, excited to be here this evening to honor an incredible group of educators. I'd like to start by sharing a quote from Nelson Mandela. Everyone can rise above their circumstances and achieve successes if they are dedicated to and passionate about what they do. This evening, we will be recognizing a group of educators who are dedicated and who are passionate. They have had to rise above everyday challenges, teaching, planning, meetings, family obligations, missing time with their family, all in preparation for their national boards. These are educators who, are already, who were already successful, but they were dedicated and passionate about learning more and moving forward. The National Board for Professional Teaching Standard was founded in 1987. The goal of the National Boards is to advance the quality of teaching and learning by engaging teachers in professional learning, focusing on the rigorous standards of professional practice as defined by the National Board. Teachers who engage in the process participate in a year-long learning experience of professional growth and reflection to improve their practice and advance student learning. I am pleased to recognize this year's group of National Board recipients. We have seven newly certified teacher, teachers and one teacher who successfully completed the renewal process. So I'll begin with Brandon Jamison. Brandon teaches science at South High, where she is in her 15th year. Brandon successfully renewed her certification in science early adolescence. Brandon received her bachelor's from Missouri State University and her master's degree from Webster University. In addition to her role as a classroom teacher, Brandon supports teachers pursuing their national boards. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Amy Goldman. Amy is in her 14th year at Parkway and teaches math at West Middle. She is a national board certified in mathematics, early adolescence. Amy is a graduate of Bradley University and has her master's from Lindenwood University. Congratulations, Amy. Thank you. Emily Lemons. <laughs> Emily is National Board Certified as an Early Childhood Generalist. This is her 13th year teaching for Parkway. She teaches first grade at Barrett's Elementary. Emily is a graduate of St. Louis University and received her master's from the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Congratulations, Emily. <laughs> Kathy. 
Catherine Marshall. Catherine is in her sixth year at Parkway. She also teaches at Barrett's Elementary, where she is a second grade teacher. The title of her National Board certification is Middle Childhood Generalist. Catherine is a graduate of the University of Missouri Columbia and has her master's from Lindenwood University. Congratulations, Catherine. Liz Morrison. Liz has been in Parkway for 16 years. Liz is the coordinator of professional learning, formerly a government and history teacher at South High School. As coordinator of professional learning and the person who leads our group of teachers for national board certification, she thought it was important for her to go through the process herself so she would better understand the journey and be able to support the teachers. Pretty amazing feat. Liz is national board certified in social studies, history, adolescence, and young adulthood. Liz is a graduate of the University of Iowa and has earned her master's from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Congratulations, Liz. Teresa Waters. <laughs> Teresa has been teaching with Parkway for 23 years. She is certified as a middle childhood generalist. Teresa is a fourth grade teacher at Barrett's where she inspired four of her colleagues to join her in this journey. <laughs> and all of them have become national board teachers. Yes. The power of a cohort. She graduated from the University of Missouri Science and Technology and received her master's from Maryville University. Congratulations, Teresa. Julie Weiss. Julie is part of the Barrett's cohort. She teaches second grade at Barrett's Elementary where she is in her 13th year. She received the National Board Certification in Middle Childhood. Julie is a graduate of Miami University and earned her master's from Northwestern University. Congratulations, Julie. Thank you. and Bridget Zimmerman. Bridget rounds out the Barrett's cohort. Bridget is in her 15th year at Parkway. She teaches music at Barrett's Elementary. Her national board certification is in music, early and middle childhood. Bridget received her bachelor's and master's from Truman University. Congratulations, Bridget. Thank you. So as our National Board teachers get clustered for the photograph, I would also like to recognize all of the family members that are here this evening. So if you are a family member of the National Board Certified Teachers and Liz's family, we see you on the camera standing up with us. <laughs> if you are an administrator who supported a National Board teacher, please stand up. And if you are a teammate who supported a National Board teacher during their study, stand up. The Parkway staff and the National Board teachers appreciate all the support that you gave them throughout their journey. Thank you and congratulations, teachers.
teachers, thank you so much for coming tonight and letting us honor you. We're very proud of all of you. And usually at this time we take a short break so we can dismiss those that have come just for this part of the meeting. But in the interest of time, we're going to skip our break. So if I may dismiss anyone who feels like their part of the meeting is over, thank you and good night. Nikki, no citizen statements. No citizen statements. Okay, we're going we're gonna to start back up. Uh, 4.0, additions, corrections, and modifications to the agenda. Uh, those that we had have been added, so we'll just go on from there. 5.0, I have not been told of any citizen statements. <coughs> Kathy? No, thank you. 6.0, call for executive session <coughs> none. 7.0, approval of agenda for December 11, 2013. May I have a motion and a second to approve the regular, the agenda for the regular meeting of the Board of Education scheduled for tonight. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you. 8.0 resolutions none. 9.0 communications. 9.01. <coughs> the next regular meeting of the Board of Education is scheduled for Wednesday, January 15, 2013. I think that's 2014. <laughs> at Central Middle School at 7 p.m. Um, I'd like to mention that we've got board candidate filing for the election, the upcoming election, uh, coming up next Tuesday. That's the beginning date at 8 a.m., Tuesday, December 17th. And that will go through January 21st at 5 p.m. Um, if anybody's interested in filing, they'll see Mrs. Stover down at the end of the table. She's at the administrative building right down the parking lot from here. There will be three positions up for election. Um, those that, whose terms are ending are Mr. Jacob, Mrs. Mogerman, and Mr. Major. And um, we look forward to see what, what the filing time brings us. Uh, 9.02, board liaison reports. Mr. Major. Madam President, uh, last Wednesday I attended the uh, second meeting of the Public Review Commission, which is a... Uh, a function of the <clears throat> SSD. It's actually SSD overall, but I'm one of the appointed members by the Governing Council. <clears throat> so the every four years, the Public Review Commission uh, is charged with uh, reviewing all SSD operations, so that would include uh, special education services as well as the uh, North and South Tech high school operations. And uh, I think in in past years, it's been uh, probably higher profile, uh, but uh, and a lot of the, the strife from the <laughs> from earlier years doesn't exist. So, uh, but there will be public meetings. Uh, we haven't scheduled them yet, but uh, in the spring, probably between February and April, will be a series of public meetings throughout St. Louis County. So certainly, those with a, with an interest. Uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, they'll all be prominently advertised on the uh, SSD website, and uh, I imagine cross-posted uh, on the on the Parkway website. So that work's just beginning, but uh, obviously will be uh, extensive public input, and uh, and anybody with a with a concern, by all means, that's the the best available forum to raise it. So. Thank you. Yes. Um, I had the great opportunity this morning or this afternoon to be there at the facilities uh, holiday get-together. Uh, 
Uh, it was particularly uh, gratifying. I didn't know this, but Chef Dan prepared uh, the meal for the 150 or so uh, facilities personnel that were there, and it was an excellent job. And uh, he was there, and some of the dietary aides that are going to SLU and that are are doing internships or something like that here with us. So I was stood in line there with Mike and shook hands with virtually everybody that came in. It was a great opportunity to meet them and tell these people what they mean to us in Parkway. We uh, always talk about teachers and administrators, and all of us recognize that these are sometimes the people that make our job so much easier for us. I sat down at the table with uh, two gentlemen there, uh, Ferris and Edward. Turns out they're, they're two examples of what's right in Parkway. They're brothers. They started at Parkway on the same day 12 years ago. They uh, even uh, were interviewed on the same day, and they were interviewed together. <laughs> but it was just a delight to, to speak with them and so many others there and recognize that important uh, cadre of people that we have that uh, do such wonderful things in supporting us. They're, these two guys are on the special uh, crew. So they go all around the district and get involved in everything from shoveling snow to putting up the risers at, at graduation and other things. So it was nice to spend that time with them and we had a, a good holiday spirit there. I wish I could have seen uh, uh, Superintendent Marty as he was uh, wrestling with somebody up there and trying to give him noogies or something, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but they got him involved in their, in their fun activity. Thank you. Okay, uh, before we move on, I think we may have one or two scouts in our audience. If we do, will you please stand up? Hi, what troop are you from? And what are you working on? Great, well thank you and welcome. We're glad you're here. Anybody else? Okay, great. 10.0 um, action items. May I have a motion and a second? Or is there anything that needs to be pulled? <coughs> Okay, may I have a motion and a second to approve the recommended um, consent items as presented in the board materials. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Any opposed? Motion carries 6-0. 11.0 action items. Uh, approval of Parkway 2014 park, uh, legislative positions. Do we want to call Annie down? Dr. Marty? Legislative positions? Yes. Do we want to call anybody down? Uh, well, uh, does anybody have any questions about the proposed legislative yes, positions? Yes, uh, let's have, if there's questions. I have no stickies, but I do have a couple yeah. of questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Annie may want to be uh, on call here. She's been uh, really key in putting this together. So This is Annie she, Dickerson. Hey. Hi. This is your first round of legislative positions it is. with us. So yes. Here we go. Mr. Major. You have a question? Good evening. I do. And I guess. Uh, Maybe stylistic, but also I think uh, some some con concern regarding the uh, our second new priority position, uh, which I think addresses in general Missouri learning standards, mm -hmm. but included within that is Common Core, and uh, I think the uh, I've I've attended numerous presentations by uh, various members of the, the administration here. Uh, Kevin Beckner comes to mind. And, uh, and, and those have addressed uh, what the Common Core is and, and what it is not, and, uh, and provided, I think, uh, valuable information that uh, probably the, uh, our entire public would be uh, improved by hearing, but mm -hmm. undoubtedly they haven't all heard it. Uh, likewise, I think the, uh, the entire legislature would probably be improved by uh, hearing that information, but uh, I also know they have not heard it. Uh, in view of those realities and the very real controversy surrounding the, the Common Core, I, um, I think there's new, new proposals in the legislature just this week uh, that uh, certainly put the, the issue front and center for a lot of people. And I think just the <clears throat> the phraseology here is is perhaps a uh, a red flag to those who are uh, bear some some degree of uh, either suspicion or opposition to the Common Core. So I think as far as a, a legislative position for the district, mm -hmm. uh, we we ought to be in the business of 
of explaining and uh, explaining to the public and uh, and moving forward with education <clears throat> as opposed to involving ourselves in uh, in the culture wars if you will so I think the the language particularly uh, the otherwise un unbuttressed assertion because it's the right thing for the children of Missouri is uh, potentially uh, counterproductive. So is that the only part that you have an issue with? Well, I think the... Uh, I mean, of this, of the, of this paragraph. Yeah, and I, I'm just talking about the, the one point, mm -hmm. and I think the... Uh, <clears throat> so some of the awarding re regarding approving funding, uh, I think the, the intention of the Missouri Learning Standards is to set a higher target, if you will, and that in order to get there, it is broadly accepted that uh, new new forms of assessment, different in scope and kind from our current map testing, is part and parcel of that entire implementation. Uh, and I think I. I, I don't know if that imputes a uh, <laughs> imputes a uh, a presumption on the part of the legislature that uh, that they might be uh, planning to uh, provide us with an unfunded mandate to pay for that assessment. Or I guess my uh, my presumption would be that if if this is going to be mandated, then I assume it will be uh, much like current map testing. The state will uh, will cover the cost of uh, of those. Man mandated assessments. So I'm not real clear on the, the intent of the second and third sub bullets, which which uh, assert that the uh, the legislature should approve funding. I, w I would hope that would be uh, presumed in in whatever action the legislature takes. So there there is going to be increased funding. Uh, so I think that when we talk about the the interim informative assessments, that's a, that's a bit of a new approach. We think right. the right kind of approach. So it's going to take more dollars, and it's going to take more dollars uh, to start up some of the online testing. But uh, for us, we pretty much are there. So you know, Parkway's pretty much established our ability to do that. Uh, it's, it's real good. And, I, and I believe there's a, there's a difference in uh, the, the online testing actually is, is better in the sense that we get more information sooner. sooner. Yeah regarding the students right. and yeah. I think that's universally for for every district in Missouri that's mm -hmm. that is a desirable aspect yeah, yeah. so I, I certainly I approve of the I support the notion I'm not sure if uh, sending the uh, couching it in terms of approve the funding for I'm not sure how constructive that is Maybe what would, just, what would you suggest because uh, we're open to if it's mm -hmm. a okay but and I'm <laughs> Paul Tandy is far better at uh, communications than I could ever hope to be, but I think couched in some terms of uh, the <laughs> providing the benefit of the doubt to the uh, to the legislature. So maybe uh, provide and support implementation of online testing, provide interim and formative assessments to support student learning, something along those lines. Uh, Bruce, I think every time I've talked to a legislator or been in a meeting with legislators. Talking about this, the mm -hmm. very first question they ask is, they don't say what's different, they don't say how is this going to help our kids. The first question they have mm -hmm. is how much is it going to cost us? And um, I think we might be kidding ourselves to think that that's implied. You know, most of the, most of the people that are serving in the current legislature mm -hmm. were not in there when uh, we first started talking about Common Core State Standards. And even though apparently Dusty explained it um, in quite quite a bit of detail back then, most of those people have been term limited out. And I think part of the reason for the uproar right now is because a lot of these people are hearing it for the first time. And I kind of think we owe it to them to spell it out as plainly as possible to let them know that it's costing money, costing more money than they spend now. Okay. And that on, on those points, I... I'm somewhat agnostic, okay. but uh, just uh, had some trepidation about uh, 
anything that looks like a, a, us dictating uh, outcomes of the legislative proce process. Right. I think but our, I think I think we need we, to we can advocate them, without and it's uh, nice to have it in print mm -hmm. that they can't ever say we didn't come. <clears throat> okay. All right. Did you have more? No, I think that was it. Oh, I, I apologize. On the on the first one, it was just that uh, the first priority position transfer of students from unaccredited districts, and that it's phrased as Parkway supports the consensus among Missouri education <coughs> leaders, and the rest follows. Mm -hmm. I concur with what follows. I'm not sure how that appeal to authority uh, enhances the the statement. I think uh, th this is Parkway's legislative proposal, uh, not not CSDs, not uh, MA SAs Massless. or anybody else's, and I think we're uh, we, we ought to speak with our own voice and not not necessarily make appeals to uh, other other entities that uh, that ain't us. So, would you be happy if we said Parkway believes that busing? Students, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So Absolutely. Can we make that change. We can do that. As for the change, uh, Mr. Major, in that, in the, uh, because it's the right thing for the children of Missouri. I mean, I think we probably did borrow that. I think right from. We did borrow that from CSD. It's directly in their priority positions for this year. Okay, and and I certainly respect CSD. Right. Education. Plus. plus. Education plus. Yes. Are they changing their name to protect the innocent or the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, but again I think our 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 position ought to stand on its own and, and be our own. Just uh, I d I don't feel strongly about about it having to be there. I think the, the thing I think that C S D probably put it there is it, it is the the idea is as students move from district to district, it is a benefit to the children of Missouri or the country <laughs> that okay. we have some kind of common standards, but I, you know, you're right. We don't necessarily need to say that. This is part of the statement. I, I guess my objection would be there. I have talked with people that sincerely, and for a variety of reasons, uh, think the Common Core represents either present or future trouble, mm -hmm. and I think we ought not throw it in those people's faces and claim the moral high ground of we're doing it for the children. Uh, often the last refuge of uh, legislative scoundrels in the last 50 years or so in my experience but uh, I, I, I think we can make our assertion without that that particular uh, verbiage yeah. well, well, that's okay. fine. all right so let's see I would like to see if we can get a motion to approve the legislative positions as amended just now so that would be to um, take out park, uh, supports the consensus among Missouri education leaders, mm -hmm. and we're going to substitute believes in there. And then um, the second position, um, the second line removed because it's the right thing for the children of Missouri, and just move that period over. We can do that. Correct. Okay, is everybody clear on that? Okay. So All at right. this point, can I have a motion and a second? that the Board of Education approve the Parkway legislative positions as presented in tonight's materials as amended. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries 6-0. Thanks, Annie. Thank you. Mrs. Feldman, I just want to say uh, uh, Annie has done a great job uh, in, in, tr in moving this forward quickly because I know it was the desire right. of the Board to have this in the hands of the legislators as they went back to work in right. January. So we, we are clearly ahead of the game here. We'll get that clearly out and in the mail and to legislators and often they tell us when we meet with them I, it, why didn't you tell me mm -hmm. so here we are trying to get out in front of all the busyness that happens when they first get back into session mm -hmm. and this will be sitting on their desk waiting for them when they when they start in January so and to address your question or your comment about communications we have a number of communications um, planned that we can provide as well in terms of letters to legislators meetings that we're having around Common Core and communications with our community too so. I, I think readily accessible yes to our powerpoints and, and other things we've and already Kevin communicated Beckner. to our public Kevin Beckner has done all there of those we're, million we want, documents we want them to be accessible we want you to be accessible to our legislators because we think that you say the words that they can understand 
and you know make them see it perhaps from our point of view. And he's such a pretty face too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he's Not presenting. just a pretty face. <laughs> Kevin is presenting to our legislators next Friday prior to our winter break. So that will happen. Super. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, 12.0 uh, policy review. There is none tonight. 13.0 reports. We're going to hear from Dr. Watson on confident learners. Goal three. Good evening, President Feldman, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Marty, Mrs. Stover. It gives me great pleasure to stand here before you and represent the parents, the students, the community members, and the staff who have already contributed to this amazing work. Let's turn it on. Here we go. As you know, goal three is the work around competent learners. And since your last update, we have made progress. We certainly have covered some ground, but we still have miles to travel. The exciting part of our journey is that now all schools see the road, and we now have a parkway direction. In the late winter and early spring, we took our draft of the character education commitments and definition on the road and through cyberspace, seeking feedback from all employee groups, students, parents, and community members. Parkway's definition of character education is the intentional effort to develop in young people core ethical and performance values that are widely affirmed across all cultures. Core ethical values promote the development and welfare of students, serve the common good, and define our rights and responsibilities in this democratic society. Performance values support the ability to take initiative on the core values, which serve as our foundation. Both of these working together create a socially and emotionally balanced individual. We now have a common language and commitments to our students, to our community, and to each other. This certainly enhances our work around our mission, our learning principles, and our commitments. While the Character Education Action Team processed the feedback on the commitments that we took around town and through cyberspace, the Student Services Action Team also began really looking at the commitments and the connection to the strategic plan. The Student Services Team has taken our goal three measurable objectives and our action steps and we've aligned them to our character education commitments. And let me tell you, no measurable objective or action step was left in the dark. These character education commitments, they are the strategic plan to implement and achieve goal three. So tonight, I'm going to give you a peek at some of the work around commitments one, three, four, six, and nine. Commitment one. Schools promoting core ethical and performance values help establish a common language of character at school. When values are clearly defined and reiterated to everyone, the building sets those clear expectations. The language is then used to teach and reinforce character, being very intentional. Many of our schools have already engaged in this work and have identified values. Here you see Ross's values, Highcroft Ridge's values, as they are in the office on the wall, Oakbrook's values. One example of being intentional is Oakbrook students attending the school assembly where the students are explaining their school virtues. At Riverbend, students recite their character pledge each day during the morning announcements. As you can see, the pledge contains their values. Some of our schools are revisiting previous philosophies. Central Middle currently has three focal points that were developed to promote positive behavior. They have decided to engage the community 
and thinking about what core ethical and performance values would look like for Central Middle. And they look forward to going through this process. Commitment three, opportunities to transfer values into real world settings. We know that student advancement in the society depends on our students understanding their own strengths, their own interests, and their goals. And it's key for them to clearly understand how character impacts their future and the path that they can take to accomplish these goals. Becoming a self-advocate through goal setting and action planning is paramount as related to academics, careers, health, social, and civic responsibility. And of course, this is more apt to occur when students are grounded in good character. When coordinators complete the task of coding courses by career clusters for students to reference during the registration process, the goal setting process and monitoring of progress will be much more impactful to our students. Another area of focus for Commitment 3 is Naviance. Currently, we are identifying what is working well in Naviance in grades 6 through 12. As we assess our gaps and our assets, we are also creating a multi-year plan for Naviance implementation, and we will have that done by the end of the school year. This is such a powerful tool that we have been underutilizing here in Parkway. It is our goal to use Naviance exceedingly well to benefit our students here in Parkway as they think about transferring their work to real life settings. Another focus with Commitment 3 is service learning. And you heard much about that during our last board meeting. I just wanna share that here is a team at Central Middle studying Latin America. And they were exploring how they could make a difference as they investigated people and what they needed to survive in El Moto, Nicaragua. And they decided to attack this issue by a fun run walkathon. Commitment four, the school community uses a comprehensive and proactive approach to character education development. This commitment guides us to guaranteeing character education for all of our students through the curriculum. How might this be done? I'm sure that's the question you're asking. Well, we have identified and agreed upon three evidence-based core competencies to support our students and their learning. Self-awareness and self-management, social awareness and relationship skills, and responsible and ethical decision-making. Within each area, we have character standards, and K-12 performance descriptors. So let's go into the classroom. Let's see what this might look like. Do you all remember this book, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day? Certainly you do. So as you see, the core competency that we're going to address as you are in my third grade classroom for just a few minutes will be social awareness and the social Awareness standard will be recognizing the feelings and perspectives of others. So let's go into that third grade classroom and work on the character descriptor of labeling the feelings of others. I'm not gonna read the whole book, I'm just gonna read one page. So, then we went to the shoe store to buy some sneakers. Anthony chose the white ones with blue stripes. Nick chose the red ones with white stripes. I chose the blue ones with red stripes. But then the shoe man said, we're all sold out. They made me buy plain white ones, but they can't make me wear them. So think about the teacher reading this book in class. In addition to the academic content that they want to teach through choosing this piece of literature, they will also be able to intentionally teach character and talk about what feelings do you think Alexander has right now? Why does Alexander have those feelings? That engages students in the dialogue around our character standards and descriptors. So where are we going? 
There are so many Parkway teachers who are already doing this work in their classroom with students. So a key strategy in accomplishing the objectives for the rest of the school year will be engaging these teachers among other Parkway leaders and engaging them in helping us already understand how they are going about intentionally teaching character with their students. The end result of this work, hopefully sooner than later, will be a character curriculum on the OCG with our academic content. Also, the Elementary Feedback and Grading Committee has a tentative agreement to use the character standards as a framework for feedback on the non-academic skills and performance. This work is continuously evolving here in Parkway, and isn't it an exciting time for all of us? Last winter, we finalized our climate domains. Relationships, safety, teaching and learning, and school environment. The domains and indicators are currently embedded and incorporated in our character education commitments. Two methods that we have used recently, and for years actually, to assess school climate are the climate survey, and for two years we've had the bully survey. Our students are telling us how they feel, and we are listening. Over a decade of climate survey data, it tells us, tells us that on average, two-thirds of elementary students report always feeling safe at school. In addition, almost three-fourths of our students in middle school report feeling safe at school always or often, while a strong majority of our high school students report feeling safe at school often or always. When it comes to student-adult relationships, on average, almost three-fourths of our elementary students report that an adult at school knows them very well, while two-thirds of our middle school and high school students report they agree or strongly agree that an adult at school knows them very well. Although we do only have two years of bully data versus the multiple years of school climate data, the bully data tells us that bullying rates have dropped at our elementary level and our high school level and remain consistent at the middle school level. This data is important as we look at developing a baseline for our work and as we continue to determine how to measure our progress. It is important to note that we still need to ensure that all components of the nine commitments are measurable. The team is currently researching whether this involves revising our existing surveys, combining assessments into a more streamlined tool, or aligning resources to increase efficiency. As mentioned earlier, the existing district climate survey and bullying survey are just two sources of data available to us as we measure our commitments. But there are also multiple other sources available as well. Attendance rates, discipline data, adult culture survey data, those are just some of the examples that we are currently looking at to link to our commitments as we measure our progress. Some of our schools are already beginning to be intentional, to intentional about this work of assessing. At South Middle, students take a connected survey in the fall and spring, in addition to the school climate survey. Students are asked whether they enjoy coming to South Middle. Do they have an adult at school they can go to with a personal problem concern or concern? At North High, they give many climate surveys throughout the year. And the questions that they ask are a subset of the climate survey questions, such as, I know how to report harassment, bullying, and racial abuse to school officials. Central Middle School is currently working with one of Dr. Marvin Berkowitz's students at UMSL, who has developed a character growth index. According to Dr. Berkowitz, an international character education leader, this tool may very well be the first reliable and valid measure as we think about measuring an individual student's character growth. 
Within the next month, all Central Middle School students will take this measure. Also, when administrators develop a survey to assess the adult culture and understanding of character education, they do that through the Leadership Academy in character education. It is important to note that the de development of staff as character educators is just as important as our plan to develop our students as students developing good character. In September, all staff had the opportunity to take the adult culture survey. Employees rated questions one through five with five being the highest and one being the lowest rating. Based on this five point scale, the following questions received a four or five, the two highest ratings. 75% of the respondents rated, my supervisor treats me and all employees equitably, a four or five. And the same for this question, a four or five. And this last one, 71% of the respondents rated the climate culture of the department in which I work, a four or five. Clearly, we want that to be 100% of our employees rating that a five. But this is a good baseline for our work. We certainly also need to move forward systemically seeking feedback from parents and community members. This task is currently being worked on as part of Commitment 6 with members of the Character Education Action Team. Having common language and commitments around Goal 3 is so incredibly key. And now we do have that common language. And we have some schools that are models for others. Ross is a national school of character. McKelvey, a Missouri school of character. And we are anxiously awaiting to hear about Sorrento and Oakbrook, who have already submitted their applications to be Missouri School, a Missouri School of Character. As I said last year, we have a gob obligation to help our students develop their character. Because good character is not formed automatically. It's developed over time through a sustained process of teaching, learning, example, and lots of practice. When students are grounded in good character, they have the confidence to do well academically and the skills that will enhance their lives here in Parkway and well beyond. We can't afford to slow down this work. We must continue. Countless children, as you know, are being born each and every day. And those parents are holding that bundle of joy and they're trying to decide where they are going to go to school. And we want Parkway to be their choice. We want all of our community members to know that we provide an amazing educational experience as we address the whole child. So as you prepare for questions, I must acknowledge the leaders of this work. I stand here before you as a messenger and as a participant. But as you know, when you have goals and you have aspirations, you cannot do it alone. So I want to recognize Michael Barilak and John Barrow and Alyssa Gratz and Charlotte EJ and Aaron Schulte and Jennifer Stanfield. And they have a gift for you as you continuously think about the work that we are doing here in Parkway to develop our students and our adults as good character models. Questions? Hmm? Oh, you're welcome. I was just curious. Uh, it seems like one important part of uh, getting character into the school and part of the curriculum <laughs> and, and everything else is uh, the LACE program where our administrators. Uh, so I'm curious, is that something that I know we encourage it, but is it completely voluntary or are we looking for volunteers all the time? Or how many have taken it? And then what are they doing with it when they get back? So I thought Ben was switching out my PowerPoint. 
today, I added, tonight I added a picture. We had seven administrators graduate from the Lace Academy actually today. And I got a great picture of them. They're all dressed up and they're at the country club and they went through their graduation. And we have eight administrators that will be starting the cohort in January. And so we highly encourage our administrators to think about this professional development opportunity and how it can impact and change their school community and culture. We have our character education commitments and it is an expectation that all of our schools develop a plan to guide their communities in working toward these nine commitments. We know every school is at a different stage and so we have put in place some structures and some systems to help start allowing them to communicate, collaborate, and think about what that may look like. Because as I said, we have some great things going on here in Parkway, but we also have some other resources. And so we are feeding them information and helping them along the way based on where they are on this journey. So do they meet as a cohort then or come together as a, a the, group of administrators that have been through this to? The, the folks that are involved in LACE meet once a month at UMSL with Dr. Berkowitz and the other experts that he brings in around the country. Today during principal's meeting, Aaron facilitated levels conversation around three of our commitments. So the South area of principals and the North area of principals could really start and, and so forth. Have that conversation about what's going on as we think about kids transitioning from elementary to middle and high and for them to learn with each other. The character ed team has also set up a character roundtable on January 30th, where we are inviting administrators to send their representatives from their school who are working on this character education work. We will be focusing on three commitments specifically, commitment one, eight, and nine, because with the self-assessment that they took this summer, and the conversations we've had, that's where we find most schools want to work right now, commitments one, eight, nine. And so we have some folks coming that are leaders in that work to provide development for others who are ready to engage in that work. Does that answer your question? That's helpful. I'll, I'll keep asking you. I'm, by the way, I'm glad that you're over your cold. I know you <laughs> suffered. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would just add that. Uh, Chelsea wouldn't say this, but I think she's she's been a, a and, and Aaron as well, and others have really been, been been pushing others to take a look at lace and other opportunities. And I think our expectation is, as Chelsea explained, when ready and when appropriate, when it fits into their their you know their personal and professional lives, we really encourage our administrators to go through lace. And I and, and many are taking advantage of us and are taking advantage of it. And fortunately, Dr. Berkowitz has uh, been uh, been very kind to us, in allowing a number of our our people in. So. So originally I had 31 artifacts for you all. I pulled some, but one of the artifacts that I pulled had the list of all of the administrators in Parkway who have gone through LACE. So Chris, I can happily send that to you at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Chelsea, can you give us a brief overview about what is happening in Naviance? Because as far <coughs> as I know, um, I only know it as a college search tool, and I know it's got, there's so much more to it. So my question is, A, what is there to it, and B, um, Aaron, I should ask you, and B, do parents have the same access that their kids have? Like I know, for instance, in the college thing, the kids log in and parents go in as a guest. But for the younger kids, um, sixth through tenth maybe, um, do parents have access to see what's going on in there? Yes, parents can have that access. Schools are at different phases in this work. And that's why we are working, Aaron, Jennifer and I have been working on thinking about what this plan looks like. We have been working with a consultant at Naviance who has been looking at the reports and how have we been utilizing Naviance in Parkway over the years. Who's using it? So Aaron and I and, and Jennifer, we can go in and we can look at every school and every grade level and we can see what schools are doing what, how they're utilizing the surveys and the various tools available to them. And that is helping us 
in developing this 612 plan. Because to be honest with you, right now, how counselors have been using Naviance has been up to them. But when we develop this plan, it's not gonna be an option. It's gonna be a guarantee that this is what needs to happen in grade six. This is what needs to happen in grade seven. Because it's a great tool to help us accomplish really many of our goals, but specifically as we look at goal three, measurable objective three, and setting those goals and having kids to be able to interact with their parents and with their teachers, Naviance is a great tool to do that. Uh, I would just add that uh, as counselors, we kind of gutted our curriculum over the summer and started reworking it from stage one on. And I think that's also going to help with the, like right now they're working on stage two, the assessments that they'll use. And a lot of it has centered around, okay, it'll be this, you know, our, the way we'll know that they know this is that they'll have this information from the survey they took on Naviance or, um, so a lot of their curriculum is centering on that. And I think as that work moves forward, the guarantee of all sixth graders are gonna know this in Naviance, all seventh graders are gonna do this. I think that comes along with the curriculum territory. And at what point during a school day or a school year are students uh, working with Naviance in the building with their counselors and their teachers? That, that came up this morning actually at the principal meeting when we did a, a guidance update because I, I kind of gave them a forewarning that I think counselors are gonna need more structured time as far as in the classrooms of like, we are gonna visit every single sixth grader and it's going to be planned out in this way. And so um, as, again, as we have a more substantial curriculum, that's going to have to follow. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I look forward to that. Yeah, me too. And one of the things that I have to say, and Erin and I have talked about this, Naviance cannot just be the responsibility of our counselors. There is so much more to Naviance that a classroom teacher would enjoy being engaged in. For example, if kids are setting their goals on a piece of paper and they are checking those with their teacher periodically, Naviance is a way for students starting in grade six to set their goals in every classroom. Parents can see their goals. Teachers can look on the computer and check on their goals. Students can then reflect in Naviance and their goals and it becomes part of their portfolio. They can see their growth from grade six all the way through grade 12. And so as we think about Naviance and how we've really um, approached it through the counselors, Eventually, once we have our plan and everyone is along with this plan, we need to start engaging our teachers and training our teachers on how this tool can really enhance their work with kids. Also, to look in and see their interest, look in to see their career aspirations. So it's more than just with counselors. There are huge benefits in working with counselors with Naviance, but we need to expand that. And, and if I can just add that teachers actually <laughs> do all have their own account as well, like a parent account, so they can't alter anything in there other than high school folks can write letters of recommendation for colleges and then upload it, and that's the way the schools are sending them now. Um, but I know at the middle school, we were at Southwest Middle today, and they I helped their counselors create teacher accounts, so every single teacher at that school will have an account, um, and they're chomping at the bit to use it as well, so it's exciting. And if you all have a middle schooler or a high schooler and you don't have an Aviance account, I can certainly sit with you and develop that account. I did that with Bruce and Chris a couple of months ago. So. Well, is it different having an account than just going in as a guest? Yes, okay. because you can see what your child has done in Aviance. Okay, well, that's, that's what I've always wanted to see. Yes. I didn't know I had So we can sit and do that. that. Yeah, okay. okay. Great. Anybody else? Thank you. I, oh, I have go one ahead. more question. Yeah. On the bully survey and um, the char character survey, is that the other one? The school climate? School climate. Uh -huh. You said that the numbers uh, improved in the elementary and the high school, but they remain the same in middle school. Are we doing anything different to improve those in the middle school? And so e each school looks at their own results. They look at their CSIP plan and determine how they want to move forward. So, for example, when I mentioned North High's um, mini climate surveys and South Middle's surveys, they took the data that they received from those surveys and determined what areas they needed to work on. And so that's how they created those questions. 
because they realized that was data that they had that wasn't as positive as they wanted it to be. So they implement specific strategies and then that's how they're assessing their work. So every school gets the results. We also give the middle school results so they can see where they fit in with the other middle schools because often we can learn from our colleagues based on what they're doing. So individual schools are approaching that based on their data. Thanks, great. Thank you both very much. Mm -hmm. and Thanks. Thank all the rest of you. Chelsea, great job on. How long was it? I didn't pay attention. <laughs> you just did a great job. It's a great PowerPoint. Um, next, we're going to call on Mr. Paul Tandy. He's going to talk to us about Facilities 2020. Are you being joined by your friends Mike and Mark? Okay. Come on down. Uh, good evening, President Feldman, members of the board, and Dr. Marty and Ms. Stover. Tonight, we'd like to give you a brief update on the work of Facilities 2020, the advisory team that's been meeting now for several years under the auspices of Project Parkway, as you know. And, uh, you know, the first couple of years, they were really focused on monitoring the implementation of the final projects of the 2008 bond issue, and more recently have directed their attention toward the future and looking at what we're calling Facilities 2020 and preparing for the next 10-year uh, capital uh, uh, improvement uh, planning cycle. So just as an overview, as you know, uh, Parkway operates on a 10-year capital improvement plan, and uh, we have just completed uh, what essentially was the last 10-year uh, plan with the projects this past summer. That was the, the projects this last summer were the last ones from the 2008 bond issue. And uh, that 10-year cycle uh, was a result of a 2004 and a 2008 uh, bond issues and projects from those. And uh, so now we're looking at uh, what essentially is a, the next 10-year look, which would be approximately 2014 uh, through 2024. It's amazing to look at that 2024 to, to me. It's just unbelievable, but that's where we are. So. Just generally speaking, what we're looking at, if we stay on the same sort of timeline, would be bond issues around somewhere in the neighborhood of 2014, and then again in around 2018 or, or 2019 for the next 10-year uh, cycle. Uh, <clears throat> this slide was presented at the area meetings this fall. Basically, it's a 30-year look, 20 years back, and then 10 years in the future. Uh, it's kind of hard to see on the slides, but uh, what it shows is that uh, this has kind of been our um, our cycle. Uh, we had bond issues in 1993 and then uh, 1999, and that completed that 10 year cycle, and then 04 and 08. And so now we're at that next uh, point. In our timeline, uh, this past uh, spring through the summer, the Facilities 2020 uh, Leadership Group. Uh, really focused their efforts on de developing a preliminary list, a very rough list of capital repair and renovation projects by school that could be uh, presented for consideration. Uh, then in this fall, I know many of you, or probably all of you, participated in one of the or more of the area meetings that we had with school teams, and I'll talk more about, about that in uh, a minute. Uh, we did that this uh, fall to gather input and feedback, and uh, that one's red because that's where we are now. Basically, what we're doing is we're revising the project list and adding projects that people suggested in those area meetings, and, uh, and we've been gathering input from the community uh, on their priorities for the types of projects that they think should be included in uh, future bond issues and also the criteria by which we should evaluate potential projects. So that's been very valuable. And we're using that to develop essentially uh, a scoring guide for any potential project. Then what's next is uh, in early 2014, in February, we'll have uh, the Project Parkway meeting on February 10th and March 31st will essentially be kind of a town hall format and the, for the uh, focus of both those meetings will be dedicated to Facilities 2020 planning. Uh, couched in the middle of that, uh, we plan to do a community-wide telephone opinion survey. We've done that every year, every time since I've been here, very successfully um, to gather the broader input from not just 
uh, parents, but everybody in the community about their priorities for a potential bond issue. And those surveys have been very, very helpful for us in terms of planning, and they turn out to be very accurate. <clears throat> So after the town hall meetings, uh, we hope uh, to be in a position to come back to you in around the May to June timeframe uh, with a final recommendation uh, of whether to place a bond issue on the ballot. And then if uh, you decide to do that, we would spend the summer informing the community of that decision. And then of course in the fall, we would help inform the community about what's on the bond issue, the projects and rationale and costs and so forth. And then the election will be November 4th. As I mentioned earlier, we did have area planning meetings this fall. We had about 250 participants, parents and teachers and administrators um, from the, all the buildings. And uh, it was very helpful in uh, not only giving us just some feedback on the initial draft of repair and renovation projects, but also what other things do they see in their buildings that need to be considered for potential projects. Uh, all the materials from those meetings are posted on the website. We, uh, we also did a survey um, of them uh, on priorities, and so it's been very, very helpful. Then we took that information uh, to the November Project Parkway meeting. We had a great turnout that night. Um, we had 300 or so in attendance, and more than 100 actually participated in the breakout with the Facilities 2020 team. And they helped us uh, rank uh, the project types in terms of their importance. In other words, do they think what do they think are the most important types of projects, safety and security, technology, and so forth, and also uh, gave us their feedback on uh, the evaluation criteria, what should be the most important uh, criteria when we're uh, developing this scoring guide that um, Mike and Scott Bennett and their team are developing now. I thought you might be curious to see that when we, when we surveyed uh, the participants of Facilities 2020, what the, their top project types that they think are in terms of um, their preference or of, of importance. And number one was security. Uh, number two was uh, things like HVAC, plumbing, electrical, uh, that type of uh, repair and renovation, then safety, and then technology. And I would say that's been pretty typical when we have surveys. That hasn't changed dramatically uh, in the years that I've been here. That's, that's a good validation of what we've heard in the past. I won't go through all these, but we did ask, um, ask them at the meeting to help us prioritize the evaluation criteria. So we will, based upon their input, uh, uh, Mike and his team will develop a scoring guide that basically weights uh, those criteria based on the feedback we got from the participants at the meeting. So what's next? Uh, We'll finalize that scoring guide and then really do what I think is the hardest work for Mike and Scott and their team is to score all the, the potential projects because there are many, many more than we could put on in an, a bond issue in 2014. So we have to have a method by which we try to determine which ones would make the cut, so to speak. And we're using that feedback from the community to develop that scoring guide and rank the, uh, the projects. We will present then that initial uh, results of that process at the February 10th town hall and get feedback from from the community uh, at the meeting and at the same time, as I mentioned, we'll be doing the opinion survey. We will make any adjustments as necessary based on that feedback, not only from the February 10th meeting, but also from the opinion survey, and then come back in March uh, in the 31st and hopefully by the end of that meeting have some consensus that we could bring back to you in, uh, in the next month or two after that in late spring. With that, uh, Glad to entertain any questions. Yes, sir. Uh, Paul, has it been your experience, or what has been your experience? Uh, 2014 should be a big turnout. Senate and that kind of stuff should get a lot more people out than other elections. Is that helpful to us, or I mean, when there's a big turnout as opposed to a small one? You know, I, a lot of my colleagues will say that they, they tend to go on smaller turnout elections. We've done both since I've been here uh, successfully. Uh, I think we tend to do really well on big elections because I think the broader community uh, supports education uh, and, and Parkway. I, I think we have a good amount of um, support. So I th and, and plus I, what I like about that is it's a, a larger number of people you know, casting their vote. And when you can pass something in a big general election like that, um, you know you've got the support of the community. 
I have a question. You're soliciting ideas from people at Project Parkway meetings, and then you're going to be doing a phone survey of residents of the district. How are you soliciting opinions of our uh, staff? They're in the school buildings every day, and they see the things that need to be done. So the teams of people who came from each building included staff in the buildings, both teachers and support staff, not just administrators. So that was, the, that was why the composition was developed the way it was, because we wanted those people in the room as well. Are so. we giving the rest of the staff who didn't participate in the walkthroughs an opportunity to um, share their ideas aside from Project Parkway meetings? We could certainly survey them separately. Uh, you know, we invite everybody to come to the meetings. We would hope there'd be hundreds of people in February and March, many of whom would be employees, we would hope. But we could do a separate um, survey. My, my experience has been if you open up a website and say, hey, um, go here and share your opinion, you don't get much participation that way. We can do that, but I'd rather be more direct with it. If we really wanted to do that, I'd rather do a direct solicitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just feel like um, oftentimes we do these big projects and we think we're covering everybody. And then when it's all over, somebody who you know, works in the building day after day says, well, why don't you just ask me? And you know, teachers are busy. Employees are busy. Not everybody goes to you know, Project Parkway meetings, um, right. although I was very impressed with the attendance at the last yeah. one. Um, I just think that we really need to reach out to the people who we can certainly do see that. what's going on. In the I, I've attended a couple of PTO meetings um, to, to, to present this uh, since that, and I've presented uh, the feedback we heard at, uh, at the area meetings from their school. Mm -hmm. In other words, I've said, here's what we heard from your school. How does that validate? Like, for example, um, where were we at the other night, Mark? Was it um, which school? We were at Carmen, and I presented the list of uh, sort of questions or concerns and facilities related projects that they uh, raised and I said does this validate and I got just head nods I mean absolutely yeah we got the drainage problem in the uh, playground we got to take care of them we got this or that you know so uh, it it was it was good validation um, but it's certainly be easy to do um, uh, a survey just send it out to all staff in the in an email and ha hopefully get them to go look then at their project list and then but we need to do that quickly because we're, you know, we're getting close to getting ready to score the project. So. Right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Moving right along here, Mark. We're going to talk about the budget assumptions. Everybody's favorite. Excuse me, sorry about the. It's okay. Great, because I'm not having much luck here. Good evening. Uh, time flies. Uh, it seems like uh, we just started this year, and now it's time to start uh, planning for next year's budget. And uh, tonight, uh, I'll be presenting uh, budget assumptions, which are basically the basis or the basics of which we'll be developing next year's financial projections from. Um, we're seeking input from you tonight. 
and then we'll I'll bring those back for formal approval in the January 15th meeting. Uh, we'll then develop our budget projections for next year, and on May 7th, I'll present a preliminary budget uh, presentation to you, and then you'll be asked to act on the final um, budget proposal at the June 11th, 2014 meeting. Before we actually jump into the, the building blocks for next year, I just real quickly want to point out, you know, we went through two years of budget cutting in which we eliminated uh, $12 million from our budget and also uh, close to, two, well, actually a little over 200 employees or positions. Um, we go back and we look at the actual operating results from 2011-12 you can, if you look at the schedule there, you can see our revenues were 206 million. We spent 220 million. Uh, we actually had an operating deficit of about almost 14 million dollars that year. We went through all of these budget cuts. Um, this past year, 12-13, uh, we improved our operations and actually we lost about 700 thousand dollars last year. So uh, we had a ma very major move in uh, our operations over that time frame. This schedule is actually looking at uh, our original budgeted revenues for this year, and then we amend our, our budget twice a year, once in the fall, once in the spring. Earlier this evening in your uh, consent agenda, you approved the, the fall budget adjustment. And uh, the first column there is the original budget. We, had, we budgeted revenues of 218.7 million. Uh, as we got into this year, we had to reevaluate our, our revenues, our um, or continue to see uh, successful commercial property uh, appeal settlements where um, the assessors actually returned a little over a million dollars already this year to um, commercial property tax property owners for appeals from prior years. And then actually we had to lower our delinquent tax uh, projections. Um, so we are projecting a, 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 a lower operating revenue this year than what we began the year thinking we would receive. And I did include uh, revenue projections for next year on this schedule. And as you can see, we're expecting our revenues to stay just about the same, go up just a little bit maybe next year. Um, part of the issue difference is this year's revised revenues, we included revenues from the, the um, transfer students, Normandy and Riverview Gardens. We don't have those built into next year's budget because we just don't know what's going to happen there. When we look at this year's operating expenditures, you know you can see that our original uh, budget we had 218 million budgeted, but we expected to um, end the year with an unexpended portion of the budget of about three million dollars, making our net expenditures about 215.5 million. The revised budget we've incorporated some carryover projects from last year. If you recall, we ended last year about $7 million under budget, and basically um, some of the, a lot of that, actually about $4.2 million of that was actually expenditures that just didn't get finished before the end of the year. We had about $1.2 million in there for the CNG fueling station project that actually was budgeted last year, didn't actually, uh, it's actually still not completed, but we're spending that money this year. We had held off on um, social studies and science textbooks. Uh, the coordinators were actually studying whether we needed to go with textbooks or actually online or electronic curriculum or textbooks, instructional materials. Um, the school building budgets that we allow to be carried over were included in that. So uh, when we bring those forward this year, it adds about $4.2 million to this year's budget, but I, I also, think it's safe to increase the amount that we would expect to be under budget at the end of the year as well. The net impact of this adjustment is about a $2.2 million increase in our projected operating expenditures. Um, and this is not unusual. Every fall we would carry over somewhere between normally two and four million dollars. Which takes us to our bottom line. Uh, at the end of 11-12, you know, again, we, we had the uh, operating deficit of almost $14 million. Uh, at the end of last year, 
We had an operating deficit of about $700,000. With our revised budget for this year, we're projecting about a $530,000 operating deficit. This is still relatively early in the year. I'm still hopeful that we'll, you know, we'll break even or maybe be a little better than that, but that's a, I still think a fairly conservative projection. So um, it's not quite as good as we had hoped it would be. You can see our uh, fund balance percentages are actually dip below 14% uh, if this actually plays out. But uh, it, again, it's not, it's not great news, but it's not horrible news. We're still pretty much uh, staying even. So, okay, that's what's happened so far. And now we want to start talking about, okay, developing the financial projections for next year and beyond. And there are a number of factors that, that play into that, one of the biggest one being enrollment projections, because we staff based on enrollment. Um, we also have to consider the overall health of the economy, uh, revenue projections from DESE, which includes our sales tax uh, estimates, um, our VST enrollment, uh, the commercial property tax assessments that we've been hit with in the last couple of years, our new construction, and we do hope that we will see some new construction from some of the big projects that are going on right now. Uh, interest rates remain extremely low. Inflation rates uh, play into our projections. Um, we also are negotiating with all three of our organized employee groups for next year, and that plays a, a big pick, a big part of our uh, financial projections. And then uh, legislative changes can impact what our actual costs are. This chart shows what our five-year uh, enrollment projections uh, are at this point. We have about just under 17,200 students, and we project that it will go up slightly over the five-year period. It'll go down a little bit and then back up. Um, resident, you can see resident enrollment's expected to climb slightly. VST enrollment's supposed to decline slightly, and our uh, phase two students are projected to go down just a very small amount. Mark, what's phase two? Uh, students that spend more than 50% of their time in a special ed setting. Thank you. Actually, uh, the revenues, the state revenues for those students actually get passed through to a special school district. So, as I mentioned, uh, enrollment plays a major factor in our, in our budget. And uh, when we start calculating or projecting what our teaching staff looks like or our uh, numbers of teachers for next year, we use a, a student teacher ratio. So this year we have 17,190 students and if you take our current staffing and divide into that you see that we have 13.13 students for every teacher. Um, if we use, we're not pro proposing any more reductions in staffing at this point. So if you apply that same ratio to our students' uh, enrollment for next year, you'll see that we're projecting that we would need 6.6 .6 fewer instructional staff next year. Now we will adjust this. Uh, our actual original staffing pool for next year is based on the February numbers. So these are still very preliminary. Okay, so we have this base staffing pool of 1,303 teachers for next year. We then use staffing models at the different levels to allocate those out to the schools. At the elementary school level, we use class size targets, and uh, then we also have once uh, a grade level um, exceeds their staff, um, excuse me, their targets by three at each class, then we consider adding additional staffing. It doesn't necessarily mean we will, but we start talking about it at that point and the additional staffing could be TAs or it could be teachers, um, but that, that's basically where we work from. The state standards, for the, you can see those as well, and, and our targets are well below the state standards. Um, we generally, our average class sizes generally are very close to our targets. In addition to the class sizes at the elementary level, we also add a number of staffing for specialists, and you can see the list there. Um, President Feldman <laughs> pointed out to me today that I'd for, forgotten to add uh, our math facilitators and our instructional coaches to it, this schedule this year, but they are in there. We're recommending that those continue. 
At the middle school level, uh, they, we staff schools using core teacher teams, and each uh, core team includes two English, English language arts teachers, a social studies teacher, a math teacher, and a science teacher, and then we also ha add a number of um, instructional staffing for specialist positions, and you can see all of those, PE, art, drama, facts, music, uh, the number of staffing. Each of our middle schools have uh, either two or three teams at each grade level, and uh, that's basically how we uh, allocate the instructional staffing to the middle schools. High schools, we use a straight 16.71 to one student-teacher ratio to develop the initial pool, and then we add another additional staffing for librarians, counselors, athletic directors, et cetera. Again, as I mentioned, you know, 80-plus 80, 80 percent of our budget are salaries and benefits. Uh, we are currently negotiating, or will be negotiating, with our organized groups this year. Uh, you can see the salary adjustments that were uh, approved for this year. Uh, we have not, at this point, determined any of our salary increases for next year. As far as the benefit side, uh, we know that uh, we did raise our, or we will be raising our uh, district contributions to for health insurance approximately 3.5 percent on January 1. We also uh, operate our benefits through a self-insured health plan and basically we are projecting this year, calendar year that we're going to probably have a net surplus for the year of, of around three million dollars and that's about 10 percent what we're hearing from the, our professional uh, benefits consultants is that they're expecting medical inflation to be somewhere between 8 and 10 percent next year. Um, but because we're making money this year, we aren't going to have to raise our uh, premiums, you know, at the same level as inflation for next year. So we're projecting a 5 percent increase in the district's contributions to uh, health insurance for next year. And we've also already been notified that the retirement systems will not be increasing their uh, contribution rates for next year, which is a good thing. I think this will be the third year in a row that they've not increased those. Uh, another piece of our uh, operating budget is our school building budgets. And we provide those funds to the schools using per student allocations. And we're recommending that we use the same allocations for next year that we're using this year. Uh, if you apply all of those to all of our students, it generates about $2.8 million in school operating budgets. And those are used primarily for copies and postage and supplies in the buildings. We're also uh, actually in a pretty exciting time right now. We, ex we expect to receive our first uh, CNG bus uh, over the next couple weeks. Uh, actually, our uh, Fred Matlock and, and his head uh, mechanic went out and inspected the buses at the, at the manufacturing facility earlier. Uh, actually, it was last week. And uh, they're, they're going to be delivered. All of them will be, be delivered between January, actually over the month of January, January into the first part of February. We expect to have the CNG fueling station completed in the middle of February. So uh, everything is progressing as planned. Uh, ordinarily, we would purchase 10 to 11 school buses each year. We're on a basically a 10-year replacement cycle, so it takes 10 or 11 to maintain that cycle. Since we're buying 30 buses this year, uh, we won't be scheduling new bus purchases for two years after that. So the next round would be in 2016-17. But uh, these uh, CNG buses, we're actually uh, receiving a $1.5 million grant to help fund those and then we're borrowing the balance, uh, which is about $2.1 million. And uh, you actually approved the financing for that tonight as well. Uh, I think you've heard over and over that uh, we've finished up or, or are finishing up spending our bond funds. So this next summer, we won't be doing any major projects. We do have a million dollars in the budget for emergency repairs. And we would uh, include that again for next year. Uh, our technology equipment re replacement funding. This year we had $900,000 in our operating budget 
and we supplemented that with $500,000 in bond funds. Now that the bond funds are gone, we'll have to fund the full $1.4 million out of operating funds for next year. And then uh, actually finally we're still recommending that we uh, do everything we can to um, increase our fund balances back up to our minimum reserve requirements. And uh, you know we, we have a 17.3% requirement. We're projecting at the end of this year we'll be below 14%. But we do uh, expect that I am right now expecting a small operating surplus next year. So we're hoping that we'll slowly start uh, replenishing those funds. And I think I pointed out earlier in the year that it would, because of the timing change and the way the reassessment process works, it would actually require about a 24% fund balance to, for us to avoid borrowing money uh, to support our cash flow in the October, November timeframes each year. We did borrow $20 million this year, and uh, actually we got our first property tax disbursement uh, Monday, and we'll receive one each Monday moving forward. So we do expect to pay that $20 million loan off before the end of this month. And at this point, I guess I'm ready for any questions you may have or... Start on this side, go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, just regarding the, the fund balance, pursuant to policy, we're supposed to re reestablish the 17.3% within, within how many years? Four years. Four and, years. And we officially dropped below in 2011? 12. 12. Okay. Yeah, 2012. 11 12. So, so we're not making a lot of headway in. We have not yet. I mean, first, we've, we've made a huge. The first half of our window is. Uh, Absolutely, we've not, not in the right direction. Correct. We have made a huge movement as far as our operating loss, or you know, our surplus. Right. But we've stopped the bleeding. We haven't actually started um, rebuilding those reserves at this point. I understand. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sir. Um, most likely, your health. Uh, benefits people are telling you this uh, we've been self-funded for several years and generally speaking one out of five years is horrible people get sick and all kinds of things will happen and so self-funding is great and so you just need to be careful in those good years that you keep funds available because I guarantee you, you're not going to have five good years in a row we had two bad ones in a row and it was pretty hard to recover from that. and we had some excellent ones and there's a temptation to maybe take those funds and put them someplace else, but if you do, you're going to hurt yourself a little bit later in the health benefits. So just, just food for thought because I've no. been there. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%. And uh, that three million dollar operating surplus for this year that that stays in that fund. And uh, you know, I, I I agree with you 100%. We we are that does almost build our fund balance back up to where our target is on the self-insured fund, but we do want to maintain that. Well, so. if you build that up for three or four years, then uh, you can probably make some of those adjustments. But I, I agree. Just you can get spoiled thinking that uh, oh, we had a great year, self funding is great, and then all of a sudden the, the wheels fall off. We had we had a couple of bad years uh, over the last five, actually. So, and spent down actually we spent down almost four million dollars in fund balances. So. Um, a couple of questions. I think through Project Parkway, we were looking at the middle school model. Um, and how's that work coming as far as, you know, I know it's a more expensive proposition than, than what it used to be. We still plan on looking at it closer at this point. We, we hadn't decided to dig into it too deep after two years of reduction. Right. So we kind of put it on hold for a year. To, to begin those discussions. And then are the teens full? That's my, that, um, when you said two to three teams per grade in every school, I remember a few years ago when my kids were in middle school or maybe just finishing, um, the teams were splitting. Some of the teams were having to split. And there, and, and I could probably, Desi could probably answer that better than I. 
But I, I do know we did have a couple schools that had split teams. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, South Middle School and Southwest Middle School have two teams per grade level, okay. so. Okay. We still, we still do split teams on occasion. It, it depends on where the numbers fall. So mm -hmm. it's not a pure cut when okay. it hits a certain number. So they may look at splitting seventh and eighth grade team from time to time. Mm -hmm. Typically we want to fall in that range for a team about 120 to 140. Well, we, we really don't reach the 120 range. So as far as being full, uh, they haven't ever achieved being full at South or Southwest Middle just because of the enrollment numbers. Yeah, I was thinking it was closer to 100, so it's 120? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then Mark, thank you, Jesse. Mark, on the buses, are we trading in 30? Yes. Okay, and I can't remember if there was special training for the drivers for the CNG buses. Special training, we're, well, we're actually buying the one bus that will be delivered in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna use that to train the drivers. Okay, what about the mechanics? They're gonna be working on that as well. I mean, okay. we wanted to get one early so that we had some time to make sure that we were prepared for the rest of them to be in. So, uh, yeah, Will is planning on getting his mechanics up to speed and his drivers, because they are different. These are the flat front buses, mm -hmm. so they are different to drive. Right, and we saw the green stripes. Exactly, yes. Okay. They will be noticeable. Yes. <laughs> Um, since we don't have bond funds uh, until we get a new bond passed, um, is a million dollars enough for the kind of uh, things you think might come up? I think so. I mean, we've, we've not had any major repairs to this point in the year, so we're, we're I think Mike's feeling pretty confident that we should be okay with that. Uh, as far as, I mean, basically all we're doing is fixing things that are breaking. We're not, you know, replacing things that are just getting old. So um, I, I think we're going to be okay. I wouldn't want to do that for an ongoing basis. Right. On the technology side too, is that uh, more like smart boards that we're starting to refresh, or it's most? These are computers. The 1.4 million is for computers. And those um, are those ones that we lease, or do we purchase them? No, we purchase them. Uh, we we had looked at we'd actually leased for a few years. Um, the challenge is, you know, a lot of most places lease for three years. Yeah. We have a tendency to keep computers much longer than three years so it kind of um, yeah. it's not necessarily as cost effective for us and a lot of times a four or five year old machine is perfectly fine to surf the net yeah. so absolutely okay thank you okay. all right on to the next phase of 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 the mark stockwell show sure as you saw in the next month if you have questions the board and this mark's going to come back to you for approval just remind you, the last couple of years we've come to you with assumptions as well as re approval of reductions. Right. We're not going to be doing that this year. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so if you have questions, uh, you know, certainly raise those uh, to Mark or, or thoughts. But he'll be working on moving these assumptions to really part of them, the budget format and the process. All right, thanks. We're going to talk about sports marketing now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, through goal six, We've spent a great deal of time over the past couple of years trying to become as efficient as an, and effective as we can be. Uh, along with that process, we've been out researching opportunities for alternative sources of revenue. And um, we actually kind of stumbled into a, an, an idea uh, about a year ago. Uh, Columbia Public Schools is actually contracting with an outside company to manage a sports mar marketing program within their district. And uh, we've had conversations with them. And basically, they've hired a company to come in and market their, their logos, their trademarks. Um, and they actually, one of the biggest um, tools they're using are, are video scoreboards at their football fields and their, and their gyms. And they go out and they solicit sponsors for the district. I think Columbia has a university. They have a hospital. Uh, I think a local car dealer, an orthopedic surgeon group. But they develop, you know, short ads that run during, you know, timeouts and halftime at, at ball games, and Columbia has been very successful in raising additional money for their athletic programs through this. Uh, the company they work with also provides uh, professionally designed um, team brochures for each of their games for all of their sports, and uh, again, we've had a number of conversations with them, and. 
we've talked to, I think we've shared information with you. We've talked to all of our principals. We've talked to the athletic directors. We actually even made a presentation to the Project Parkway Steering Committee. And at this point, uh, although I think the general consensus is that we need to be careful and cautious as we move forward, but I do believe the general consensus is that we probably should move forward with something like this. It does uh, provide us an opportunity to generate revenues without going to taxpayers. And uh, at this point, we really wanted to just touch base with, with the board to make sure you're, you know, to find out if you're okay with us proceeding with this because the next step would be issuing a request for proposal um, and to try to, you know, determine if we can find a contractor or that could come in and actually manage a program for us. Mike Gons here as well, if, if you had any questions for him or his, I know he's had a number of conversations with his athletic directors and his coaches, so. Normally, how long a contract is, is this? Well, all we really know is what we've learned from Columbia. Their agreement is a five-year deal, and basically the company they work with requires five years. Um, and what I'm told is that they, they've had, they do a lot of college work, and they found that uh, organizations will contract with them and learn how to do their own marketing and a lot of times you know learn how to do it themselves and then drop them so they require the five-year contract to make it worth their while to come in and build a program for you are there many firms that are doing this kind of work not real not that we can find uh, there's a few there's very few doing it in high schools uh, there's a few more doing it in colleges mm -hmm. so uh, We'll have to look around to see if we can find other providers other than the one uh, Columbia is using. Okay. So what would be the next step from your viewpoint in terms of how to proceed with just getting more information and trying to determine is this a direction to go or not? Well, we've, we've done, I think we've done a lot of research that, that suggests that this probably is a good way. I mean, we think it's a, a good idea. Okay. The next step would be to actually put out a request for proposal and see if we what kind of proposals we get from any companies. Um, I do know that the company that works with Columbia would like to bid on our on our you know our programs but uh, you know I'm not sure if there would be others as well but they would make a proposal to us as what the kind of services they could provide what their fees would be um, you know. so would the proposals include a presentation to the board so we we can get a full absolutely the entire I mean, we can, program I'm sure if a company that's you know being considered for doing something like this would be willing to make presentations to you and, and anyone else that we'd like them to present to. And if the Colts keep the, their winning ways, maybe we can get a television contract. <laughs> that's, a, that's a possibility. <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, just a question regarding the, the video scoreboards for the football fields. Uh, We've had recent experience with uh, marquees in front of our high schools. Uh, where, I guess we've got how many different municipalities involved in? Uh, two two municipalities in the county. Uh, okay, Manchester. Two, two are unincorporated. One's unincorporated. Actually, two of them are in Chesterfield. Okay. One's in Manchester, and one's in unincorporated St. Louis County. Okay. And uh, we've had preliminary discussions with all three. And no one has told us no yet. And um, it's a relatively new thing. So mm -hmm. I, when we talked to Manchester, I mean, basically their response was, our codes don't address this. Now, the reality <laughs> is, I mean, because it's, it's and basically the, what they said is. Don't create one if. <laughs> I mean, basically the what they're considering, some would consider it right now is because it doesn't address it, they mm -hmm. would call it a billboard and because we're putting advertising on the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. And some would, at this point, I think some would look at it and say, no, you can't do that. But the reality is we've had advertising on our scoreboards for probably 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, I think it's, a, it's an it's education piece. It's joining the 21st century. It's going digital, right? It is. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, we talked to the company that did the work in, in Columbia, and their they, we asked them if they had any challenges there with ordinances and they basically said yes the fir their first discussion with the city was no you can't do it 
and then they said, okay, well, how can you explain the big, the big video board down the street at Mizzou Stadium? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and what they've kind of told us, and if you look around, there are a number of video, video boards in our communities already. They may not be on scoreboards, but they're on marquees and there are other places within our communities. And um, I saw a big one today. I was in St. Louis County at a car dealership, and there was a big one. I mean, huge. We had a, a we actually had a, a demonstration from of a, a big video board out here at Central High uh, about a month ago, and there were representative from a number representatives from a number of school districts in the area over here looking at the the display that was out there. I mean, they are neat. Uh, they're they're a lot like the small video boards that you see at Bush Stadium. Maintenance. The video board. I mean, would that be involved in the contract, or would that be just a separate issue? Well, the, the video boards would be ours, so okay. I'm not sure if they come with a warranty or or don't. Um, I'd, I'll have to do a little more research on that because I'm not sure what types of warranties are on equipment like that. But they and, are cheap. And I assume that whoever would be wanting to do this would be bidding on it would probably be looking at other school districts in the area I would assume that I again I the only company I've actually asked questions of is the one that's doing the work in Columbia and they've already signed up to they, they signed up two additional school districts within the last couple months in this not in this area okay. but they are talking to a number of districts in this area and they're primarily looking at large school districts because I you know, when they, we look at Parkway, when we have four home football games on a Friday night, you could, you know, you could have one university playing a, a short ad at a timeout, and it, and that exposure is in front of four complete football uh, attendance groups. So mm -hmm. but there's a lot of exposure there, and um, again, these guys are marketing professionals, so they're selling the advertising piece of it. look into this, um, um, Mike Gunn and I have talked, I, I think if you've been around in education for any length of time, I'll just talk personally, 15 years ago I'd have thought this was the most distasteful thing I'd want to ever get involved in. Uh, now I think we're, when you think about where we're at uh, fiscally and, and the pressure, I would be devastated to be in a position to think that we're cutting uh, anything from kids athletically. But that could become the reality because of the, the situation we find ourselves in, and there's a lot of pressure with you know all the many opportunities, and we know athletic opportunities are great for kids. So now we got this quandary: do we do we reach out and do something different, or do we have to make those tough, very distasteful decisions? And the reality is, is that um, universities, <laughs> and now as Mark says, Columbia and other schools are, are looking at this. I think. Uh, if we're really thinking about kids and thinking about our future and thinking about our ability to really stay ahead of it, we ought to look into this. Now, I'm not, you know, we'll learn more and whether we, we may find something along the way that makes us again take a, another look at this, but I really think we ought to move forward and really find out what's out there and then really, your questions are all good and we'll, we'll have many, many more questions when I'm making a decision, but I think to pursue this, given, you know, we know how tight budgets are and they'll likely stay tight and we're asked to do so much and our community, I think, expects us to offer as much as we can for our kids, but we could have to make some pretty tough decisions. And I, I would be, I'm a proponent of co-curriculars, I think we all are, and wouldn't that be to say so if we had to cut golf or had to cut uh, you know, a sport for young people uh, because we just couldn't afford to do it. So again, this is an opportunity to think differently. We've talked about that, goal six, really is a goal six uh, kind, of, uh, kind of approach. So the show me bowl check is not, Four million dollars? Uh, not quite. It's not even a million. <laughs> okay. Did we get a check for that? <laughs> Somebody gets a check. Somebody not us. <laughs> yeah. All right. But Chris is right. I mean, you know, like, you know, some some people reach out and get contracts, and you know, it's, but uh, but this is a uh, this is a, a kind of an exciting venture, uh, and and we're in a good position, a good area where I think we could have a lot of uh, a lot of companies that would and universities and others that would find this to be a good way of getting their word out. Uh, and, uh, but 
again, we'll find out a lot more as we continue to go down this road. But uh, we seem to have the support, I think, of the athletic directors, and I know there's some questions out there, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's something we had to investigate, I believe. Just what you initially showed us that, that looked a lot more professional than, than what we're used to seeing and doing, because it does cost. So am, am I hearing that you're supportive of us moving forward? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. 15.0, call for special meetings. There, sorry, none. 16.0, uh, call for executive session on January 15, 2014. We have a motion and a second that the Board of Education call for an executive session on Wednesday, January 15, 2014 at 6 p.m. and or immediately following the regular meeting at Central Middle School for the purpose of considering legal actions, causes of action, or litigation involving the district and any confidential or privileged communication between the district or its representatives and its attorneys, 610.021.1. Two, hiring, firing, disciplining, or promoting of particular employees by the district when personal information about the employees discussed or recorded, 610.021.3. Three, preparations on behalf of the district or its representative for negotiations with employee groups, including any discussion or work product, 610.021.9 and four individually identifiable personnel records performance ratings and records pertaining to employees or applicants for employment 610.021.3 so moved second mrs applebaum yes mr applebaum yes mr jacob yes dr ciartino yes mrs feldman yes thank you uh Motion carries 6-0. 17.0 recess, 18.0, we are done with our closed meeting. 19.0, may I have a motion and a second to adjourn the regular meeting? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 6-0. At this time, we will adjourn. Thank you all very much for coming, and we'll see you in January. <laughs> I guess since I made